Hi, teammates. Welcome to The Well, the Live Well podcast, the podcast that connects you to all the topics to meet you along your well-being journey. I'm one of your hosts, Jen Collings. And I'm Seth Christopher. Welcome to The Well. Hi, teammates. It is another episode of The Well. Thank you for joining us, Seth. It's July. That's right. It's July. And you know what that means. Lots of watermelon, but also lots of heat. That's right, Seth. It has been a long, cold winter. So I'm thinking we have a lot of teammates who might want to get outside and enjoy the beautiful weather that we have. Let's take some time today and talk about how to be safe outdoors when recreating or exercising in the heat. That's right. It's hot. It's July. We're getting ready to get into the heart of summer and the world's changing a bit. People are getting the chance to be outside. So let's talk about uh, a few fast facts and things people need to know. Let's do it. Fast fact. Exercising in the heat is exhausting. Research has shown that exercising, working, or playing sports in warm and hot conditions or even indirect sunlight is more likely to cause exhaustion and heat-related illnesses compared to performing these same activities in cooler conditions. Fast fact. Teammates, 80 degrees, 75% humidity. According to the American College of Sports Medicine, These are the parameters for when you should strongly consider exercising inside. Again, 80 degrees, 75% humidity. Now, what exactly does this mean for you? There's a lot of ways to be active, a lot of things that you're doing outdoors. So, Jen, what do you say? Let's dive deeper into the well. I say we do. Let's take each of these facts and break them down and talk about them in more depth. So for your first fact, you talked about exercising in the heat is exhausting. So if I think about it, this is so true, right? Even if you're playing in the pool or you've been out at the beach and you know when you go inside, you just feel so tired. So you can only imagine what it would feel like to do running or walking or playing sports in the hottest part of the day. And we all can identify with it. This is a a, a fact that I don't think really surprises folks as you might, as you were describing here, Jen, but you know, part of that is that your body is working so hard in this heated environment and a lot of times when you get to this 80 degrees 75 percent humidity or just being in direct sunlight your body is trying to transfer heat from from some of those metabolic reactions and, and things that are happening while you're being active outside and trying to release that heat to the outside environment but when we get to these temperatures and this percent humidity a lot of times there's a there's a bit of a constant so there's not you're not having that that thermic release that you might in say cooler weathers or even cold conditions when you're exercising. Well, what's interesting about the second fact with the 80 degrees and 75% humidity, I kind of chuckled to myself when you read that because, I mean, I think we start out at 80 at like nine or 10 in the morning (laughs) and then we go to 90 or, you know, in the, in the thick of the summer, it's going to be a hundred. So I definitely think as we go through, we want to make sure that we, we talk about the best times to be active so that, because 80 degrees is going to come quick now this summer. Yeah. I think that's something that we're, we're pretty much humming around every day moving forward and the humidity is not quite that high yet, but folks who are from the Carolinas or especially down in Georgia, they know that it's coming and when it hits, it's like it's like a swamp outside. So, you know, being aware of, of some of the symptoms and things that 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 might pop up as you start to exercise and some of those feelings that might be a little abnormal relative to, to how you feel, say, hey, in April or May when you're outdoor doing your run or doing your family walk or things like that, you know, you really want to kind of hone in on those in the in the next conversation. 
Yeah, so I did a little bit of a deep dive on the heat-related illnesses. I think we had touched on this back at our very first podcast when we did sun safety, but I thought maybe we'd go into a little more depth here. So heat exhaustion symptoms include when your body temperature raises to 104, that's pretty high, headaches, nausea, vomiting, weakness, sweating, and or cold and clammy skin. And if you get these kind of symptoms and you don't treat it, it can lead to heat exo- heat stroke, which is a life-threatening condition. Yeah, this is an, a really important thing to know about the signs, the symptoms, especially if you are playing sports, if you're competing in an activity like running, cycling, or, or if you have a loved one, a small one, a child, a grandchild, niece, nephew, who is participating in sports. A lot of times this, you hear about this conversation, especially around football season, come August, you know, kids are outdoors in the heat, sweating, doing a lot of activity, and sometimes they're not able to to get that opportunity to cool down and rehydrate as needed. And sometimes you get the bad stories that come about, kids who have who have had heat exhaustion, and then ultimately some some players and athletes have had heat stroke. Yeah, I know that our athletic trainers here at Atrium who work with our area high schools in North and South Carolina, uh, we've been talking with Eric on a segment that he's going to partner with LiveWell to do. And he was telling us about just this thing that they have to look at the heat index, the barometric pressure, the temperature, and they have checks they have to do every day when they're going to be out there with the football players. And they have water hydration stations set up. They, They watch the players very closely. So, you know, our team here at atrium takes this very seriously to keep our local athletes safe yeah and teammates you know we're not we're not meteorologists by any means we're just providing these parameters for for you to be aware of and as you think about getting outdoors and whether you're playing sports or not competitive or not if you're starting a program if you're just trying to be active if you're outdoors gardening doing the lawn you know all those things those are those are types of exertion and types of activities that ultimately you know create this metabolic response we're talking about that is a lot harder making your body work a lot harder to stay cool when it's hot outside exactly also ways to avoid those is like we said pay attention to the temperature but also get acclimated so as i was doing my deep dive i kind of found this to be very interesting take at least one to two weeks to adapt and do a little bit of exercise in the hottest part. If, if you know that you have to exercise in the hottest part of the day, we're going to talk about some alternatives in a second. But if you know that that's what you have to do, get acclimated. Go out for 15 minutes, 20 minutes at a time. Do the activity as closely as you can and kind of get your body ready. But then key that we're going to talk about is hydration, right? So we want to make sure that that you're getting lots of water and putting in electrolytes if needed when you are exercising in that hot time. Yeah, hydration is such an important part of of this, drinking enough water. You don't always have to reach and grab that Gatorade or Powerade. Um, Just making sure that you're getting that regular water intake. You know, it's always important and something we talk about is just part of being a healthy lifestyle is finding ways to to take in that H2O. But especially if you know you're going to be outside in the heat, taking a little bit more. Um, I would like to just revisit what you said about getting acclimatized or acclimatization is you know, essentially the current guidelines or standards are give yourself about two weeks before you can get adjusted to that that heat. Um, and so, for example, if you know that you're only going to get your break in the middle of the day and that's when you go to do your walk, whether it's around campus, whether it's at home, however, just making sure that you understand, hey, one, I might be a little bit more limited in what I can do because of the heat understanding that and then slowly progressing and giving your body a chance to get adjusted to exercising and and essentially finding ways to cool off in a hotter environment. That's great advice. I I actually not sure that I I knew that we could acclimate to the heat quite that well. So I thought that was really neat. And then we found a, a really neat tip about taking a cold shower and not blow drying your hair before you go out to do your exercise, that actually can help to start the body at a cooler core temperature. And when it's hot, you're you're not going to raise quite as quickly. So, but I I love that just taking some time to get acclimated. But I'll ask you, we're 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 in July, so hopefully people are getting acclimated. They they've done some work on this, huh? 
I've been in Charlotte for about three and a half years. I grew up in, in North Carolina region. Uh, we all know that we, we think July is the hottest month, but no, it's actually going to end up being like August. And sometimes you're really surprised come September and you're still looking at 90 to 100 degree weather. So if, if you haven't started, now is a good time to start. Think big picture. Think about what you want to accomplish. And then, you know, one of the big things we want to talk about, too, is know your fitness level. If you are looking to start your first 5K that you want to run in the fall, know that if you are not used to running and this is an adjustment, plan that out in in addition to understanding the environment around you. So I love that. And I'm going to do a little plug because we are going to be offering another couch to 8K training program at the end of July. So to your point, now is a great time to start a little bit of something outdoors and, and no, getting that fitness level up. I love that. Take frequent breaks as well and reduce the time that you're exercising. If it's in the winter and if you're used to going for, you know, 45 minute run, you may have to do adjust that to do two 20 minute runs or something like that when it's really warm. So knowing your fitness level, knowing the environment around you, you talked a little bit about hydration. We know that's so important. You know, Jen, are there any guidelines or standards out there for teammates who are like, all right, I get my eight glasses of water, maybe some days, maybe more. I feel like I'm doing well. What are some some tangible numbers and goals that, that teammates can put forth? Yep. So the eight, eight ounces is still recommended. That, and if you're not really sure what cups and all that looks like, just doing eight, eight ounces can get you there. But <clears throat> there was a specific recommendation that for men, they should be consuming 15.5 cups or 3.7 liters a day. And then women is 11.5 cups or 2.7 liters a day. So that's in the hottest part of the day. So I think that that's quite a lot. And you want to space that out. You don't want to drink that all at one time. <laughs> Yeah, and that probably with that recommendation, I'm sure it accounts for the duration of activity too. So, Correct. for example, typically if you're going to be exercising longer, I mean, or being active, again, think I'm outside gardening, I'm, I'm mowing the yard, I'm doing stuff around the house, I'm running, I'm cycling. If you know you're going to be engaging those types of activities for longer than an hour, that's when you really want to start taking in those extra fluids. And typically, you know, sports scientists will tell you that if you're not exercising for longer than an hour, the whole Gatorade, Powerade, replenishing uh, electrolytes conversation is a, is a bit moot. Yeah. Um, great marketing, great techniques. It's you know a little bit of something for everyone always, but understanding that if you're going to be exercising for a long period or outdoors in the heat for a long period of time, you need to uptake your your water. Yeah, water's the best. And and to your point about the sports drinks, we don't want to add unneeded sugar. You know, and, and in some cases, unneeded sodium, those sports drinks are specific for people who are exercising more than 60 minutes and they're expelling lots of sweat, lots of electrolytes. So water is really the best thing. But you have a really good physiological reason for drinking water. High level, you're, when, you, when you're active, your body obviously warms up part of the cooling mechanism and a response to that that metabolic activity is sweat. And so you talk about losing fluids and replenishing fluids with water and with with Gatorade or, or a plug in sports drink. And so as you start to be real active and you start to sweat, imagine that as a cooling mechanism. So in the environment, you start to get that cool breeze. It kind of cools you off. I think we've all kind of been there. Now, when you're in a hot environment, Imagine that you might not have that that same level of, of dissipation of heat, so heat heat release, but you're getting that fluid release. And so that can create with a, a lowering of fluids in the body and you know impact to the circulatory circulatory system, you kind of get a little bit more viscous in your blood and your circulatory system. You know, it's not quite as there's not quite as much water because you're sweating it all out. And if you're not replenishing it, your heart's working so much harder to just move that blood around to go through the process of of getting it to the muscles and, and, and the process that happens there. So uh, long story short, if you're losing fluids, you got to replace them. We know that if you're outdoors exercising for long durations, you're going to lose them at a higher rate. So you need to intake water and additional fluids at a higher rate to compensate for that. Exactly. And that speaks back to the fact that we're talking about, about exercising in the heat is exhausting, right? So you can imagine if your blood is really thick and your heart is working twice as hard as it would have been, 
you're going to feel tired and you're going to get excess muscle cramps and, and it's just not going to work well. So I love that that there's a physiological reason for this. But let's continue. Let's talk about some more tips that we can give our teammates that are going to continue to have to exercise in the, the worst part of the day. And you know what? I don't think we've actually said what that is. So the hottest part of the day is between 10 a.m. and 3 p.m. So if possible, if you can exercise outside of those areas, that would that would be pretty great. But, you know, it's, like you said, it's not always possible. So what's another tip that we can we can give them? Proper clothing. So you want to make sure you've got the right clothing, um, the best possible clothing, at least if you're going to be exercising in the hottest part of the day. You know, make sure your clothing's lightweight. It's loose fitted um, and even having like a wide brim hat. Hats are good, keeps the extra sun off the face and sometimes around the neck if you've got the right the right brim. And this is this is one that kind of resonates with me because I grew up in a time with sports where you were trying to cut weight, you were trying to make weight, you had on sweats in the middle of the day, it, and in some cases, um, not endorsing this, I'm just giving a, an, an anecdote here, is that had on the, the the trash bag underneath the sweatshirt and you were just trying to sweat out all, all of the, the water in your body so you would lose weight and you were cutting weight and that is not the way to do it. Definitely not the way to do it. No, not safe at all. Um, what else? What else should teammates take into account, Jen? So I'm going to piggyback on that with some sunscreen, right? So dermatologists recommend at least 30 SPF if you're going to be out in the sun. And then you're talking about August and September, you know, we're going to hit 90, 100 degrees. It might be best to have a backup plan. Maybe if there's a day you walk outside and the humidity hits you and you just can't breathe, you do something else. You connect with Toned Up Tuesday or are active and fit and you do a virtual workout at home or you go into the gym and, and do your workout either on the treadmill or, or what have you or go swimming instead. That'd be fun. <laughs> That's right. A lot of gyms are opening back up. Um, she's talk Jen's talking about our active and fit partnership. So making sure that if you're you're not aware, there are some opportunities and discounts out there for you to, to go into a gym and take advantage of a much lower rate than, than you might normally. And that might be an alternative if you're, if you're looking to get back in the gym and especially during the heat, but also some virtual at home. I mean, a lot of people have gotten more comfortable doing the virtual workouts and, and being at home and have a space set up or have, you know, made a space that they can do it. And so taking advantage of those couple of options can can be a great alternative. You'll get the same sense of reward. It might be a different type of activity, but at the end of the day, you're still doing more today than you did yesterday, and you're still setting yourself up to do more tomorrow than you did today. Absolutely. And virtual workouts at home have been, like you said, it's kind of been a, a newer thing. I'm not an exerciser at home typically, but thanks to the last year, I have become one. So we have lots of resources. We have wrapped up our section pretty succinctly. What do you think? Yeah, great tips. A lot of awesome information. Um, yeah, I know we covered a lot, Jen. So why don't you break it down for us? Why don't you tell us, you know, exactly what we learned today? So we learned that there are some extra precautions that we need to take when exercising outside during the hot summer months. Arguably, the most important thing is to be on the lookout for the heat-related illnesses if you're outside in the heat for that long period of time. Like we just said, between 10 a.m. and 3 p.m. is the hottest part of the day. So if you can, try to get your exercise outside of those hours. The key temperature that we're going to look for is below 80 and below 75% humidity. And then hydration, hydration, hydration. Yeah, lots of great resources. You know, we'll, we'll definitely post, you know, our sources here from the well for, for teammates to reference. Um, more importantly, you know, taking these tips and, and, and kind of molding them to your plan, to your life, as always, trying to figure out how to make this work for you is, is what's most important, understanding the variabilities in your life and how you can do your best to be your best. Our next podcast will be airing on July 8th, and we will have Cindy back with us, and she is going to talk to us about vacation budgeting. This is going to be a fantastic show, so definitely don't miss this one. Well, I definitely will not be missing that one because that's a that's going to be a great conversation. And teammates, don't forget to visit the LiveWell website for more info on managing stress, working with a LiveWell health coach, and additional info on some of the fitness and virtual resources that you might be able to take advantage of this summer. And remember, the well has a web page now under the LiveWell site, so check that out. 
Our resources are listed at the end of the show, and we'll add links to the programs discussed today in the comments on our streams channel. Looking for more things live well? Not following our streams channel yet? Search The Well on streams in Office 365 or find us on the Live Well website to access all our content. Thanks for listening to The Well today. Stay safe. And live well.